So, Abram, I think it's um, I, I think most people have at least some type of intuitive sense that um, our relationship with the environment um, has changed enough that is some of these viruses that we're dealing with are a you know, function of, of climate change and development. I don't know that there's, and I think you write that there is no evidence that um, coronavirus is a function of climate change. We do know that like Ebola, for instance, is a function of uh, human development encroaching on areas where, where uh, there are, are bat habitats. But uh, give us the, the sort of the, the, the broader picture on how, um, how we're doing in terms of like viruses relative to how we were doing, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago, and to what extent that is a function of climate change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the number of infectious diseases, viruses, uh, and, and other uh, new, what they call emerging infectious diseases, uh, has been, as I wrote, skyrocketing. Uh, the number has just been significantly increasing every year, um, uh, with several diagnosed a year now. Uh, and it's really just a question of if those actually spread into the larger population, which is when we notice them. But they're almost always occurring, and they're happening in the background, and more of them are being identified and, and studied every year consistently. Um, um, they're clearly due to environmental causes, and those environmental causes are broken down between, um, you know, encroachment on wildlands, deforestation, and and you know, human-caused, uh, you know, sort of destruction of wild areas, and as I write, uh, the influence of climate. Um, climate is, uh, you know, as it is with most things, it's a, you know, it, 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 the CIA calls it the, the threat exacerbator. So it's rarely the single, um, you know, focused cause to blame, but it's always the thing in the background kind of making it worse. And so when you look at the emergence of diseases um, with environmental causes, uh, climate is you know, a smaller, smaller and growing um, influence. It's going to make them a lot worse in the future. It's a detectable influence now, um, and it's a greater influence than it, than it was a decade or two ago. I, I am I'm struck by the um, the the mechanics of it. I mean, there is a, like a you know that that insects and rodents and smaller animals seem to be more successful in this environment. And it's almost like, I don't know, it, it just sort of feels like a metaphor for, you know, rotting wood or something like that, that, um, it is when, when, when things begin to degrade a little bit, it's, it's not the bears you have to worry about in the country. It's the ants, uh, or the, uh, the termites or the, the mice and the rats. But let's, um, I mean, walk us through this. Like, how does this, how does this work? That uh, um, that 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 climate change would exacerbate and I guess give an opportunity for more infectious diseases to be revealed, I guess, is the word. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's it's um, the complexity, as you said, and the subtlety to it is, you know, it's kind of mind boggling. I and mean, I've been an environmental reporter for 18 years and, and uh, you know, sympathetic to these issues. And I don't think I've ever seen um, before reporting on this story such a sort of clear lesson in how, you know, the least expected and seemingly least important, uh, you know, small changes can make a big difference, you know, in larger systems. Um um, and you see these subtle ripple, ripple effects that result in diseases, uh, you know, in all sorts of ways. The, the, the primary connection that I was interested in reporting my story is the role of biodiversity and declining biodiversity uh, in the emergence of infectious diseases like coronaviruses. Um, and climate and climate change is becoming the most significant driver of declining biodiversity around the world. So that's to say that, uh, you know, as <clears throat> temperatures change and precipitation patterns change with climate, uh, it changes the availability of food or the habitat, uh, let's say the, the fauna, the, the plants uh, that uh, grow in a certain habitat for a certain type of wildlife. 
um, that stresses the population of that wildlife. Maybe it forces them into a population decline. Maybe it forces them to move, uh, to shift slightly. They change their migration patterns or they move slightly northward in search of more abundant source of uh, a certain fruit on a certain plant that is their primary food source. Um, and as they do that, they move closer to uh, places where uh, human development is coming from the other direction um, through the establishment of farms or the deforestation uh, for resources or the mining of, of minerals or oil and gas. And it's that interaction, that collision uh, where these viruses are emerging. Um, wildlife hosts diseases. It's always it's always been that way, and it's not necessarily the case that they host more diseases now than they used to. Um, but uh, the diseases are much more likely to spread to people, and they are spreading to people as a result of this interaction um, than they ever have in the past. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, could could in in a, in an alternate universe, right? I mean. <laughs> One could think that, like, okay, the lack of um, the the sort of um, the the narrowing, uh, the shrinking of biodiversity, oh, that'll knock out uh, a bunch of carriers of viruses. But in fact, it's 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 the it's the opposite. I mean, what like that's not what what is the mechanism that that it that that is like? You know, that's not a coincidence, right? I mean, there is a, it, it has to do with the nature of of viruses of of these uh, of the the carriers of the viruses that make them more durable in some fashion yeah, I mean, there's studies on both sides of this issue, but I was really interested in uh, the prevalence of what what scientists call the dilution hypothesis, which is essentially this, you know, uh, boiled down is you know this idea that um, you know there there's strength in a system that is diverse and it's weaker uh, the less diverse it gets, and so that's to say that there's let's say there's a dozen viruses in an ecosystem of a thousand species. Um, those viruses uh, travel around the immune systems to fight them off are strong and they tend to peter out without going very far. And as that species pool declines to say a hundred species, um, some of the strength, you know, some of the strongest immune systems that might have dead ended a particular hypothetical virus don't exist any longer. And so the virus finds, uh, you know, more traction in those remaining species and it tends to spread further. And once it spread further, spreads further and grows to a certain, you know, uh, level, it then has, you know, inertia and, um, and momentum that allows it to make, make that jump, um, potentially into the human population as well. That's, um, that's fascinating. Um, I mean, that is, that is the case it's also, weird. I mean, I think they, found, I mean, it will, I mean, it really, I mean, it really is, uh, because you could, uh, I mean, in, in, intuitively you could think like it's the opposite on some level that maybe it, it has the, but, um, it, it really basically just says it's almost as if it's like a combination lock and we're moving from like five turns of the dial, uh, five different numbers that you got to hit down to like three. And the odds are just better that the virus is going to be able to hop, jump, and skip between these three as opposed to the five. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's also the, the, the issue of which species survive. And some species, you know, carry uh, viruses uh, or other emerging infectious diseases better than, better than others. So that's to say that, you know, as, as uh, biodiversity declines or the number of species declines, Due to climate or due to other other pressures, um, the you know say the predators disappear and and what emerges uh, you know with an absence of predators are as I wrote about in my piece uh, rodents and bats for example and those are two species that are incredibly prolific in spreading um, infectious disease uh, between the two of them the vast majority of of diseases are spread by you know mice and rats and 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 bats um, which serve other purposes so we don't want to get rid of them um, but their the their thriving populations allow for you know a greater abundance of disease and then those pop, those you know rodents especially um, they prosper in close proximity to people so whereas you know elephants are going to die out as as human settlements get closer the rats are going to find food sources in our trash cans and the bats are going to build nests in the eaves of our buildings and again that proximity brings them in a collision course where the viruses that they carry. Um, have a greater likelihood of, of then connecting with people. Is there something beyond our encroachment um, that also makes us vulnerable that has changed or, or no? I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm fishing here. 
Uh, I'm just curious because um, are, are, are there... Are there ways that we structure ourselves and our lives outside of the fact that we're encroaching that make us more or less vulnerable? Well, yeah, from a systemic perspective, uh, I mean, the links are in terms of viruses, it's, it's declining biodiversity driven in part by climate change that is leading to a greater likelihood of viruses jumping to people. Uh, the extent of global travel before you know this current pandemic is another. It doesn't increase the likelihood that a human being gets infected by the virus, but then it exponentially increases the the likelihood that once a human being is infected, they will infect others who will get on an airplane and skip across continents and go to a music concert and infect a thousand more people and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, travel, our, our global, you know, globalization, uh, the interdependency of our economies, all these things, um, you know, a, a just population growth alone, the fact that there's 7.6 billion people on the planet now when there weren't a couple of decades ago, all of these things, you know, contribute to the, you know, faster um, and uh, broader spread of, of disease once, you know, once that sort of spark starts the wildfire, so to speak, um, that fire is going to spread further and faster. Uh, we're both, uh, we're talking to each other from our respective homes, so maybe this question is a little bit... Um, has already been answered, but how are we doing in terms of uh, sort of, I guess, competing with these viruses? Yeah, you know, um, I think that's difficult to say and maybe outside the bounds of, of my reporting. I mean, what I did hear and what was very concerning to me, um, it, you know, is the extent to which, uh, from a policy perspective, the American government is not supporting the kind of research um, that was making progress against these viruses. And I don't know if that quite means, you know, that we're losing, um, but it certainly means that there's missed opportunities. You know, for example, you know, I looked at, um, you know, a National Institute of Health program and a U.S. Uh, aid program uh, called PREDICT uh, that had been funding research uh, in South China. Uh, which is one of the hot spots, a jungle hot spot, where a lot of emerging uh, diseases and, and viruses are coming from, and, and probably where uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus has come from. Um, and, and, you know, the researchers involved in that program described to me, that, you know, their holy grail of ambition, which is that they might have been able to, or they might soon be able to develop a vaccine for a whole family of viruses. That's to say that we don't wait for COVID-19 and try to develop a virus, but we develop a proactive uh, or develop a vaccine, but we develop a proactive vaccine that could, um, you know, defend us from, you know, a hundred different kinds of virus, coronaviruses that all have some similarities. And that work was interrupted uh, in late 2018 when, um, you know, the current administration cut funding for it. Um, then in, you know, 2019, when it yanked staff out of, uh, out of China, um, and it, you know it's it's been extended on a sort of a you know a temporary uh, basis now just because of the current crisis. But in general, we haven't supported that kind of research, and we haven't supported the kind of science that might lead us uh, you know to be able to take anything other than a reactive uh, stance against these these diseases. So the the Trump or because uh, I hadn't heard this. I mean, there's about a half dozen. It sounds like. Um, things that the Trump administration did to make us less prepared for this, but the, they, they pulled the funding for predict. When did, when did that happen in 2017 or 20? Yeah. So the funding, uh, the, the funding cut was announced in late 2018. The program, uh, it's a global program. So, uh, you know, from central Africa to, you know, Malaysia to, to South China, um, I was most interested in my reporting in, in the pro, you know, in the, parts of the program in uh, South China, uh, that was cut and canceled um, by the end of 2019, actually just a couple of months before the first uh, COVID-19 case was diagnosed. Uh, you're probably hearing a lot now about this, you know, these uh, uh, theories that the virus was released from a lab, uh, a biological lab in, in Wuhan in China. Um, that's a lab that's connected with this USAID uh, funding. That's a place where they have had been studying the viruses that um, that scientists affiliated with this USAID program, this Predict program, had been bringing out of the jungle to uh, you know to study the their genetic makeup and and try to understand their potential better. Well, uh, Abram, thank you so much uh, for your time today. It's fascinating stuff, and also um, a little bit. 
uh, terrifying, even as we are living uh, in the midst of a pandemic now. Uh, I spoke to an epidemiologist on this program, I guess, about, I don't know, three, four, five weeks ago and asked him what his greatest fear was. And he said, uh, uh, COVID 2022. And, uh, uh, you know, frankly, um, it, it, it may not come in 2022, but uh, there's a reason to believe that uh, on the path we're headed, it, it's coming again. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your interest. I appreciate that.